You're listening to a message preached from the pulpit of the Bible Baptist Church, St. Thomas, Ontario. I'll give you a message this morning I've entitled, The Best is Yet to Come. The Best is Yet to Come. When I take groups to Israel, I say that repeatedly until we get to the empty tomb, until we see the very best. Know that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again. This morning, I want to take you to the best is yet to come. I'm not going to take you there. I'm going to take you somewhere else and show you some great things this morning from God's holy word. Pick an invention in our generation, one that comes uh, a long way. Uh, I would think of computers. I remember when some of the first computers came out. How many of you remember the Commodore VIC-20? Anybody remember that? Uh, if you remember that, uh, you were on the cutting edge of computers back then. You would have a cassette player, cassette tape player, and all your information was sort, uh, stored on a cassette tape. It was pretty incredible. Uh, then came the Commodore 64, and it had color. Yeah, uh, it used to be just kind of a gray screen with uh, uh, white lettering or a black screen with white lettering. And uh, it was a huge computer and, and uh, really didn't do very much at all. But uh, we've come a long way with computers. Today, you wear a computer on your wrist if you have a Fitbit. Uh, your phone is a computer. I think that would be one of the other uh, great inventions of our day that we all take advantage of today. Uh, I think when those things first came out, many were skeptical and thought, these things aren't going to go anywhere. Nobody's going to use them. I remember the first guy that told me about the Internet. His name was Alan Kirkland. And he said, oh, have you been on the Internet? And I said, what's that? And he said, oh, it's the World Wide Web. And I said, what's that all about? And he goes, well, you can talk to people all over the world and you can get information. I said, that's a waste of time. Nobody will use that. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't invest in it. Inventions, remote control planes, drones, now cars and different things they can do. Just when you think it can't get any better, this thing is phenomenal. It's amazing what it can do. Then it seems like all of a sudden, wham, something comes along and there's something newer, there's something faster, there's something better. And we're at an age in technology where we expect that to happen now. Something comes along and it's awesome. And you think it can't get any better than this, but it does. When I think of what God has given to mankind, I feel the exact same way. Just when I think it can't get any better than this, God reveals something really awesome. Each stage of life brings something new and exciting to it. When you're a child, it seems like every day something new and exciting happens. You get into those teenage years, and it doesn't happen every day, but it seems like maybe monthly great things are happening in your life. You're getting uh, an education. You are getting uh, to drive a car. I was watching April got a new car, and she posted some things on social media, and she was hugging her car and driving away in her car. It was kind of neat to see. That's an exciting thing when you get a, when you get a new car, your first car. When, when you get your first job, and you get that first paycheck, and you realize the government has taken half of it away from you. That's so exciting, isn't it? That's a wonderful thing. It can't get any better than having a job, except I get half the pay. It's exciting. Then you start dating, and you find that special someone in your life. That's exciting. Then you get married, and that's exciting. And then you have kids, and that's exciting. And then those kids do things, and that's exciting. And then you get to midlife, and your world crashes. How many of you are between the ages of 25 and 35 right now, or 40? Let's go forward, 25 and 40. Right in, right in those ages, uh, life kind of halts for a minute, doesn't it? I tell you, it, it's a struggle. We, we kind of joke about the midlife crisis, but I got to tell you, it's a very real thing. Because here's what happened. Your life is all excitement, 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 excitement. You get to a point in your life and you realize, I haven't obtained all the things I wanted to obtain. I haven't done all the things I wanted to do. When I was dreaming as a teenager, I was going to be driving a sports car and I'm driving a van full of four or five kids. French fries everywhere, boxes everywhere, cups everywhere, stains everywhere. This is not what I thought it was going to be. Or, or you think, you know, I was, going to, I was going to amass this great fortune and I was going to have all these wonderful things. And you get to that midlife and you realize the life I have left is maybe not as much as I've had. Can I correct the things that are wrong and can I achieve the things that I wanted to achieve in the space of time I have left? I'm going to tell you it's a very real thing, but I'll tell you, it gets better because the best is yet to come. You'll go through that time and, and most make it and do well, but there are some that struggle a little bit. But you're going you're gonna to come through that time and here's what you're going to realize. What I've been able to accomplish is a blessing. God has blessed me to be able to do what I've done 
Because let's face it, most of us deserve very little in this life. And most of us have far more than we probably ever dreamed that we would have. But it doesn't make us long to have uh, the accomplishments and the dreams of life fulfilled. And you cross over that line and you look back and you begin to look at your children and you begin to realize the blessing that they are. And you begin to see how God's moving in their life. And you see what they're accomplishing. And you realize that though I may not have all that I thought I would or be all that I thought I would be, what I have is really awesome. And the time that I have left, God has allowed me to be able to look back and see and now look ahead and really find out what's important in life. We're going to look at a number of characters today that went through life and they had some awesome things happen, but they had some great difficulty as well. And when you look at the end of their life, you think, well, man, was it really all that great? All that they went through, the, the blessings were great, but all the hardship, there, was it really that great? Our passage this morning tells us that when you look at life and when you look at your life, you can't look at just the span of life we have. We have to look beyond that. The characters that we're going to see this morning had an everlasting effect in many ways. And in your life today, you're making some effect on people's lives right now. In the days ahead and in the days far ahead. You see, what I'm doing now is having an impact on my children. And that impact is going to be placed upon their children. And Lord willing, if he, if he tarries his coming, upon their children and their children and the people that they meet. I'm praying that my kids are a great witness for Jesus Christ. I pray that they love the Lord and serve the Lord and always ha have a, a great walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that, telling other people of Jesus Christ and training their children to love the Lord Jesus Christ and to accept the Lord Jesus Christ and to tell others of Jesus Christ. And as we do that, our influence goes farther and farther and farther. Let me tell you this morning that your presence in this church, your service in this church, your worship in this church has an effect that you don't even know about many times. There are people that will come to me periodically and say, Pastor, I came to Bible Baptist Church years ago. And they'll ask this, are so-and-so still there? And I'll say, yeah, they're still there. Oh, they were my bus captain or bus driver or Sunday school teacher or usher or sang or played the piano or, or were kind to me. It's so good to know they're still there. I'll see people and they'll say, Pastor, I came to that church and somebody was very kind to me. Somebody did something for me. And you may never know the effect that that had in that person's life. That person prayed with me at an altar one time and it made a difference in my life. Your life today, though it may seem very short, and it does at times, though it may seem not very impactful at times, we have to remember the best is yet to come. And you may be looking at your life today and say, you know what? Life's been hard, and it's been cruel, and it's dealt me some hard hands, and I don't know if I'm going to make it. I'm just going to keep plugging on for the Lord. Know this, the best is yet to come. We haven't seen it yet. We really can't fathom it. I would say of those inventions that I mentioned, those who, who invented those first computers, the Apple computer, uh, you know, just became an, an incredible thing. Steve Jobs became an incredible businessman and, and philanthropist and all those other things. I, I don't know if he ever, ever fathomed uh, building a computer in his garage, what he would ever be able to amass and, and the influence it would have on this world. And the IBM machine, the business machine, the working of those first PC computers, if they'd ever realized, and to think of where that's going. You can't live a lifetime long enough to know the impact that some of those things in your life are going to have in the life of others. Let me show you what I mean this morning. I want to take you to Hebrews chapter 11. I'm going to give you just two verses, but I'm going to go through a whole chapter. I'm going to do it very quickly this morning. I'm going to give you the synopsis because it would take too much time to do each one. But let me give you this this morning. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 39, it says, And these all, talking about those that we're going to talk about, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Received not the promise. God, having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. What does that mean? Here's what it means. God did not reveal 
to all people of all time what their part would be in the bigger plan of God. I really don't know all that God is going to do by the workings of the ministry of Pastor Al Stone and especially that of the Bible Baptist Church. I called a preacher the other day. He called me and I called him back and we got talking and we're talking about the church. And he said, it was a gentleman from the United States, pastor from the United States. And he said this, I want you to know your church is iconic. Your church is iconic. And I said, why did you say that? He said, what other church could say, we're going to reach our nation with the gospel of Jesus Christ. To say that you've already completed half of your nation with the gospel. That's iconic. We get cards and letters all the time from people who are receiving generals. I just got another report from Brother Michelle. They had had more visitors again last Sunday in their church because of the health program. I I get cards and letters sometimes from missionaries who say, hey, listen, we had a tremendous service. You're a part of that because you support our work. We, We don't get to share all of those things or we miss some of those things. But I want you to know this church is having a huge impact, not only in this community, but around the world. And and we don't grasp that sometimes. And and, and we're careful because we don't want to, you know, boast and say, well, that's us. We know it's the Lord Jesus Christ. We know it's him. But he does use people. And he used people in the Old Testament. He used people in the New Testament to do things that, that they would never know the full extent. I don't think the disciples ever knew the full extent of, of what it was they were doing when they went out and began to preach the gospel. Many of them losing their lives. Many of them being tortured for their faith. And they gladly did it, but they did not see the promise fulfilled. God said, I'm going to do something great. And they longed their whole lives to see it, but they didn't get to see the completion. But God said, don't worry. There's something better to come. There's things in your life today that you're doing that you're not going to see the completion of. You won't have enough time. You won't have enough energy. You might not have enough money. I don't know. But you're not going to see the completion of it. You've started something. I've started a family with my wife, and and, and my kids are going to grow, and their kids are going to grow, and things are going to happen. I am not going to see the completion of some of those things. I'm not going to live that long. I'm not going to see the completion of some of the things of the Bible Baptist Church. There are things that are going to happen here, and there are going to be great things that are happening in days when I won't be here. In days when maybe I'm with the Lord Jesus Christ, this church may see the revival that we've prayed for for years, and I've prayed for it, and I've wanted to see it, and and I want our country to be changed, and I want people to flock and know the good things of God. It may not happen in my lifetime, but God says, don't worry. The best is yet to come. (laughs) There's some amazing people in Hebrews chapter 11. It's called the Hall of Faith, and I want to show you some of those this morning. To get the full understanding of that, You have to read the whole chapter for the sake of time. I'm going to recap it for you in three sections. I want you, first of all, this morning to see the better bitter. The better bitter. In verses 1 to 6 of Hebrews chapter 11, and and I'd ask you to do this. Read the whole chapter when you go home today. Don't don't read it while I'm preaching, but uh, I'll give you this in verses 1 to 6. God reminds us of the faith of Abel and Enoch. Abel and Enoch. Abel was one of the first children of Adam and Eve, and he had a brother, and his name was Cain. Abel was told of God, and Cain was told of God to bring a sacrifice. And so God gave instruction, and those two differed in their presentation of their sacrifice. Cain brought a beautiful display of vegetables from the garden that he grew. And Abel brought a lamb. And prepared it before the Lord. And Cain got upset and he killed Abel. Abel died. But Abel was faithful. And Abel was right. And God used Abel and the example of Abel to help us in understanding how we ought to come before the Lord. We talked about it in our Connect classes this morning. We need to come humbly before the Lord. We need to come with those holy hands. Great point made this morning. I got something great from our class this morning. Those holy hands. What are holy hands? Why are those holy hands held up? uh, The idea was that, you know, we're coming and and surrendering to God. But but I got this thought, too. I didn't get to bring this up, but I thought this, too. It's kind of like a child in distress or in need. What do they do? You watch. You'll see little children around here. Saw some children yesterday. Fell down, got hurt. This is what they do. Mommy! Daddy! They raise their hands up. They want to be picked up. They want to be comforted. 
They're, they're raising their hands because they're in need. That's, a, that's an international distress sign of a child. <laughs> Often this goes with it. The hands move. Help me. Pick me up. Take me. I want you. And, and I think the same can be the, the, with prayer. Father, I need you. And, and I come not, not, not doing this, not, not the praise, not, not the praise. I, I'm doing the worship. Lord, I need you. I, I'm humbling myself. And so we come and this man, Abel, came humbled before God, obedient to God. God said he did not see the conclusion of the matter. He didn't see all things that could have, should have been in his life. But there's something better to come for you, Abel. Don't worry. Don't worry. Your life was cut short. Your, your brother took your life. Your, your blood cried out from the ground. The best is yet to come. You had some good things. You had a good life. You had, you had a great example. But the best is yet to come. And, and then we see of Enoch who walked with God, and then at 365 years of age, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 5, verse 24, for God took him. God took him. Enoch is an Old Testament picture of the rapture. He was walking with God. He was, he was right with God. He had a great relationship with God. And then all of a sudden, Enoch was no more. God took him. God said, Enoch, 365 years of faithfulness, serving me, loving me, Having a relationship with me, Enoch, you're not going to face death. Come on, you're going to just you're just going to come on home. It's okay. Awesome. It's a picture of us living the Christian life, and, and we don't live 365 years anymore. Uh, we we live good lives, and I would say again, happy birthday to Mrs. Luxon. Celebrated her 90th birthday this past week. Is able to celebrate a little bit with her family. She's in her 91st year. Awesome. And uh, that's a great life. That's a long life today. And I believe she's got some more years, but she said this. She said, Pastor, the next 90 years are going to be even better. What does she mean by that? For our young people's sake, I'll tell you this. What she meant was, I'm not going to live those whole 90 years here on earth. I don't know what the Lord will give her. He could give her, he could give her many years. But know this. She's not going to live to be 180. Mm-mm. We don't live to be that long. But, but if you eat your vegetables, uh-uh. If you apply this ointment, uh-uh. Not going to happen. We just don't live that long. The Bible says 70 years. Mrs. Luxon has had 20 years beyond that promise because I believe she loved her parents. She was obedient to her parents. She was faithful to the Lord. And God saw fit to give her that extension of life. And she has used it for the Lord. So what's she saying? She's saying, Lord, uh, Pastor, whether I live here on this earth for a number of years, I know this. There's a time when I'm going to leave this world and I'm going to go to that new world of heaven. And that's going to be okay. That's all right. That's really living over there. We're living now, but we're really living over there. Enoch was walking with God 365 years. It's hard to, for us to even fathom. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. One day we're going to be walking in this life. I don't know if it'll be in my lifetime or your lifetime or our lifetime to come, but there's going to come a time when one day God says, son, go get my children, and Jesus Christ is going to return. The Bible tells us there's going to be the sound of a trump, the shout to come up hither, and in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we're going to leave this world, that we're going to leave this old body behind. We're going to have a glorified body set with our soul, and that will live for eternity with Jesus Christ. That that's the rapture. That's the next great church event. That's what I'm looking forward to. I've got a couple burial plots, but I'll tell you what, I'm going to sell them cheap if Jesus comes because I'm not going to need them. And even if I do, if my bones are put in that ground, if my body's put in that ground and Jesus comes, I'm not going to need it anymore. This whole body will be changed to a glorified body. See, will that, what will that look like? About 25 pounds less. Glorified. <laughs> Everything else is just right. Oh, I can't imagine how much better it's going to be to have that glorified body. A faith instituted in sacrifice and the keeping of it as God had ordered. A faith maintained by the offspring of one who did not. These did the bidding of God thinking it couldn't get any better, but the best was yet to come. Then we see those rewarded with the better benefit. The better benefit. Verses 7 to 13 include Noah, Abraham, and Sarah. Noah receiving the benefit of his 100 years' work of building an ark. Abraham receiving the benefit of a promised land and a magnificent lineage. Sarah receiving the benefit of a miraculous pregnancy. Could it get any better than being saved alive while the entire world perishes? 
And we think, oh man, that was great. Their, their family of eight were spared and they're on the ark and, and, and everyone else perished because they were wicked and God saw the world was not what it, he, he uh, uh, wanted it to be and because of man's sin, he destroyed it, but they were left alive. That's all and good, but can you imagine being the only eight people in the world? You better get along. <laughs> you better know how to work hard because you're starting a civilization over. We often talk about Adam and Eve, but listen, Noah and his family really were the first people again. And, and from them came all the, the nations of this world and the, and the seven billion people that inhabit this planet today all came from the initial start of Adam and Eve, but then Noah and his family. There were some great blessings, but there were some great hardships as well. Noah fell to sin. Noah got drunk. Noah did things he shouldn't have done. His family had some struggles. So one boy is cursed. It's hard. And, and we look at life, and we, and, and we all do this, don't we? We'll see someone's life, and we'll think, man, I wish I had their life. Man, I wish I had that guy's job, or his money, or his vehicle, or, or his family. We, we all dream about having somebody else's life. But I'll tell you this, you can have it, but you have to take all of it. All of it. Because all we see sometimes is the good. All we see is the exciting. All we see is the prosperity. We don't see the years of tears. We don't see the hardship. We don't see the frustrations. We don't see what goes on behind those closed doors. We don't hear the arguments sometimes. We don't see the loss. And so we look at these and we think, oh man, I've been so awesome to be some of those first people and to be saved alive. But yet there were some hardships that went with that. We think of Abraham. Receiving the benefit of a promised land and magnificent lineage. But man, I'll tell you what, Abraham had to go through some tough times. He was put to test, wasn't he? Take your son and Isaac and offer him as a sacrifice. Have your firstborn son and his mother leave you and be estranged from you. Sarah receiving the benefit of a miraculous pregnancy, but having to wait over 90 years to have that child. Could it get any better than being saved alive while the entire world perishes? Could it be any better than, get any better than being chosen by God to be his chosen people? Could it be any better than being given a child that would bring the Christ, the Messiah? As awesome as those things were, God said the best was yet to come. Because you see, Abraham didn't get to see that magnificent population that God had told him about. As the stars and as the sand of the sea, so will your people be. A great, huge nation. He didn't get to see all that. Sarah didn't get to see all that. Uh, Noah didn't get to see what this world would be today. The best was yet to come. And then we see those who look for the, the, better, the better bargain. In verses 14 to 22, Abraham got Isaac for his willingness to offer him Jacob got to bless the sons of Joseph for his heartbreak. Or Jacob did. And Joseph got to be buried with his people for his faithfulness abroad. Abraham, we know, great man of God, awesome man of God. Man who God used mightily. We see Jacob who got to finally see his son Joseph that was taken and stolen away really from him and sold off into slavery and went into Egypt, became a great leader. Brokenhearted, cried many days because his son that he loved dearly was gone from him. But got to restore that relationship. Got to see the sons of his son. And Joseph got to be buried with his people. Take my bones with you when you leave here. God is going to visit you, Israel, the Hebrew nation. God is going to visit you. And when he does, foretelling the coming of Moses, when he does, take my bones. Take them out of the coffin that's here in Egypt and carry them to that promised land that we've all looked forward to for so long. After 400 years of captivity, when we leave this place, take me with you. As, as much as I've enjoyed my time in Egypt, as much as God has blessed me and restored my family to me, all those great things, this is not where I belong. This is not where I want to be. I want to be with my family in that promised land. Some great stories of the Bible. 
Few would cling to the hope that a child taken would be restored. Few would make the very best of an evil and intense situation, knowing all the time that it was God's perfect plan, as Joseph did. And God gave each of these a great escape, a great blessing, a great understanding and directive. But the best was yet to come. We see, fourthly, the better birthright in verses 23 to 29. Moses, born a Hebrew, raised in the palace of uh, the most powerful ruler of that time, reduced to an outcast, called out by God, chosen to be his spokesman, commanded to lead God's people to their promised land, all by faith, all by listening to the voice of God in a burning bush. Imagine, imagine God speaking to you that way today. I'm going to make a a great nation a great place, and you're going to lead them there. A nation that you've left, a nation that you weren't part of for a long time. I'm going to make a very difficult situation. You're going to have to go through that, but you're going to go into a promised land. And then to think that he got all the way to the promised land and couldn't enter in because of sin in his life. Some would say, well, that's terrible, you know. Here he did all that work, 40 years, putting up with people, nagging, complaining, uh, having to be put to death, many of them, uh, suffering through the wilderness, wandering, and, and, and all that. And he disobeys God, and God says, you don't get to go in. You'll see it, but you don't get to go in. And he takes them up to Mount Nebo. The Nelsons were just there. They took a trip over to Jordan. They were able to go to Mount Nebo and look over into Israel and see that promised land. And God miraculously opened up the whole land so that Moses could see the whole thing. And he showed them where each tribe would go and the part of land that they would have. And then God said, they're going to go across. And Moses, I'm going to to bring you home. I'm going to take your life and I'm going to bury you myself. Nobody's ever found his body. You see, well, that, that kind of that stinks. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't really sound fair. But here's what Moses understood. The best was yet to come. The best was yet to come. And here's what the children of Israel had to understand. The best was yet to come. Be the leader of a rebellious people or the prince of Egypt, Moses received the better birthright by being a Hebrew, by being one of God's chosen people. By being chosen of God to lead those people. By faith, Moses was born and hid. By faith, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. By faith, chose the suffering of affliction with the people of God. By faith, esteemed the reproach of Christ a better reward than the treasures in Egypt. By faith, forsook Egypt, kept the Passover, and passed through the Red Sea. By faith, witnessed the magnificence of God in 40 years and the, and the miracles he did in the supply of his people. By faith, delivered his people to a promised land. All by faith. Folks, we walk by faith. We look forward to what God's going to do. I trust that tomorrow God's going to care for me. I trust that God's going to care for my family. I trust that God's going to get me through the hardships I'm going to face. I trust that God's going to be with me in that time of passing. I trust that the days ahead are better days. And that the best is yet to come. By faith. We had a great meeting on Thursday, and if you weren't there, I'm sorry you missed it. I had uh, Mr. Alan Houston come from Williams Funeral Home to speak to our seniors. He's a great speaker, did a great job. The first 30 minutes, he talked about the importance of having a faith in Jesus Christ and having a church relationship so that when you come to that place of death, you have those things in place most needed to be able to go on from that place of death and to help your family go through that time of grieving. It was awesome. He talked a little bit about funerals and a little bit about some of the costs and things. But the best thing that he brought was this. He said, there is going to be a revival again, I believe, because of the great sickness that's in our land. And he said this, I believe mental illness is the greatest sickness we have in our land today. And people are mentally stressed. People are mentally fatigued. People are mentally challenged today. Because they don't have faith. I thought that was awesome. Because when your mind begins to race with all that's going on in life and all the hardships of life and all the turmoils of life and all the difficulties of life, and when you get to a point you think, at some point, that's the end. And that's all I've had. And that's all I get. I'd be disturbed in my mind too. You know what keeps us going? Do you know what helps us not have to struggle with some of those things? And and Christians do struggle with those things. Don't get me wrong. There's some struggles. Sometimes it's physical. Sometimes it's we just get away from the Lord. Sometimes it's just part of life. 
But for the better part, most Christians don't struggle with those things the same way that some of the world does because we know this. The best, say it with me, is yet to come. It's not about this life. A few weeks I said, ago, I said, it's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about this life. This is a very, very short segment on an eternal line. The, the better part is coming. I don't know all that my life's going to be. I, I, I don't know all that it's going to bring. I don't know all that's going to accomplish. I know this. When I die, there probably will not be a stoppage of the world. There will not be uh, television cameras at the house. Uh, Pastor Stone has passed away. There's not going to be newspaper reporters. Tell us all about his life and what he did. That's probably not going to happen. It, it, there'll be a little obituary, and they'll say, uh, Reverend Al Stone uh, passed away in his, his whatever year. You can fill in the blank. His 99th year. And I would say, oh, I almost made 100. And I would tell people I was 100 because I'm a preacher and that's what they do. Um, evangelistically speaking, I was 100. Uh, no. Uh, what every year? And, and, and some might say, well, I'm disappointed. That's all I've had. Maybe tomorrow I'll wake up and, and I won't feel right. And the doctor will say, I'm sorry, but it's just a matter of months. And some would get mad at God and some, some would uh, be angry that, that they didn't have life and that they didn't get to see their kids and they didn't get to... But as a Christian, we've got to remember this. The best is yet to come. It's not now. It's not here. It's ahead of us. I want to show you filthy, the better battle. Verses 32 to 38. Verses 30 to 37. Joshua, Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, and David. Samuel and the prophets are all listed in verses 30 to 37. All great warriors in their own right. And some who endured great hardship. We read of that. Let me show you this. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. Let's read verses 33 to 38. This is talking about these characters that we've mentioned, and these that we're mentioning now, who through faith subdued kingdoms, uh, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, uh, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of, of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in, in fight, uh, turned to flight uh, the arms... Armies of aliens, women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might be obtain, uh, might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, they moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts, and in mountains, and in dens, and caves of the earth. Some of them had hard lives. Some of them had hard ships. Some of them died cruel deaths. It wasn't all roses. It wasn't all smooth sailing. It wasn't all peace and calm. Most of them suffered some great ordeals in their lives. And maybe you're sitting there today and thinking, Preacher, I'm having a hard time here. I'm going through some tough times. You don't understand the misery that we're going through. You don't understand this body and how it aches. You don't understand the frustrations of our family. You don't understand the bills are kind of tight. You don't understand that, that, that I just don't feel worthy of some things. Pre preacher, you don't understand. Listen, I do understand. I understand this that most people who have loved God and served God have had to go through some hardships and go through some difficulties. And mine will be different than yours. And yours will be different than someone else's. But we're all going to go through some tough times because going through those tough times, listen to me now, going through those tough times makes those days ahead even sweeter and better. When you do come through it, when you do see a great result, when you do see the opportunity for greater things to come. Our lives today are so busy. And our lives today are so compacted sometimes. I think we just need to stop sometimes and look ahead to what could be. You take any great inventor. We saw a, a play about Alexander Graham Bell, more so about his wife. Part of the reason he invented the telephone was because he was working with deaf people. His mother was deaf and his wife was deaf. And he was working with ways to communicate with other people and the telephone became one of his inventive ideas. He had several inventions, several, several inventions. He was a very wise man, but I'll tell you what, he had a hard life. He had some children die. He, he had uh, some very tough times communicating with his wife and she with him. They had some struggles. 
And we think of Alexander Graham Bell, think, wow, what a, probably one of the greatest inventions of all time, the telephone, which really led to the cell phone and, and, and many other satellite communications, all those other things, all started because a guy wanted to talk to other people and be able to hear them. I don't think Alexander Graham Bell ever thought, one day people will pick up a phone that's wireless and be able to call around the world and in real time be able to speak to them. I don't think he ever dreamed that I would be able to see someone on my phone and speak to them as if they were right there next to me. All that hardship, all that time, I mean, it it almost cost him and really did his life because he was so, so anxious, so concerned, so intense. He almost lost his family. For what? Because he saw a great need and he had a great hope And he thought, if I can get this, life will be better for others. And folks, I think sometimes we have to look at our life and say, you know what? My life's kind of hard sometimes. And I put a lot into this. And I'm not really seeing the fruit of my labors, but we have to envision for others. If I live for Christ now, if I give my life now, if I sell out to the cause of Christ now, what will it bring for others? I love the cycle that we're seeing in our church. Some of the kids that used to be in our nursery are now the ones who are serving in the nursery and having children that are going to be in the nursery. That's awesome. The circle of life, it's amazing. And in our Christian lives, we have to see those ones that we were once that small child and then we got saved and and somebody gave us the gospel and we, we went on to serve Christ and we were able to lead this person to Christ. Now that person's over here telling people about Christ. And quickly those other things begin to vanish away when we feel like I've had a purpose. I've been used of God and his plan. The final thing and the conclusion of this message very quickly is this, finally, the better bearing. Every one of those aforementioned looked by faith but did not see the finality of their faith. They they didn't see the faith that their faith would father. And they didn't see the fulfillment of God's eternal plan of salvation. You see, every one of those Old Testament characters were looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. Abraham knew that in Isaac was the hope of the Messiah. And he thought maybe that in Isaiah, that would be it. I'll take you back farther. Adam and Eve, I believe, thought that their boys would be either the Messiah or in the lineage of the Messiah. They, they thought when, when, when God gave them uh, th- their, their son Seth, he's the Messiah. And they all look forward, they all look forward, they all look forward, but they didn't see it happen. God gave them the sacrifice of the Old Testament. He said, this is a picture of what's yet to come, but the best had not yet come. And they thought, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. But it hadn't come, and they didn't see it come. But they all lived with the anticipation that the best was yet to come. And that best was Jesus. We who have lived since Christ have had the very best view of God's plan. We've seen through God's holy word how each of these mentioned drew mankind closer to the receiving and understanding of who the Christ would be. But we have had the privilege, and with all since Christ, to see God's promise of salvation. And we have seen the hope of heaven. But yet, for us, the best is yet to come. For we have yet to see Jesus in that heavenly home that he's preparing. As awesome as this church is, as awesome as this Christian life is, as awesome as all that God gives to us is, don't you just want to see Jesus? Don't you just want to see what he really looks like? I don't think the artists really capture who Jesus is. I do a little wood carving. I really enjoy it. One of the things I learned about wood carving is this. You can, I, I carve animals. I, people are very, very hard. Never tried it yet. But I've done some animals, and here's what some old men told me when I first learned about carving. They said that animal will not come alive until you put the eyes in it. It's true. I carved a loon, and, and it looks like a loon. It's got the right shape. Head looks really good. I painted it up, looks, you know, if you put it out in the lake, 
Somebody might think it's a loon or a rooster or, or a horse. I'm not sure. And, and I've got a picture of it sitting on the table, and, and it looks good. And then you take those red eyes. Loons have those very distinctive red eyes. And you set those eyes into that carving, and I'm telling you what, it comes alive. I just did a dolphin and um, got it all done and showed my family this is what it looks like. And it, I mean, it looks like a dolphin, but when you put those two little black dots in there, it comes alive. You know what I want to see about Jesus? His eyes. When you look into someone's eyes, they say that the eyes are the gateway to the soul. Yikes. Uh, <laughs> the eyes are the gateway to the soul. You, when you look into a person's eyes, when you, when you look deep into their eyes, you can, you can really see a lot about that person. I believe it was Brother Dorr told me one time that he went to an optometrist, and the optometrist said, you're a very happy person. That was you that told me that, right? I said, you're a very happy person. Oh, wow. Well, optometrist. <laughs> he said, you're a very happy person. He said, why'd you say that? He said, because when I look into your eye, they use light. And he says, and happy people have that light reflect back. He said, and you, that, that light really reflects back in your eye. You must be a very happy person. People that aren't happy, that, that light is absorbed into the eye. Very interesting. I want to look into the eyes of Jesus and really see who he is. And I want Jesus to look at me. It's going to be awesome. Are you having a hard time today? The best is yet to come. Do you think, I'm working, but I just, I just don't have to see, seem to have what I, what I thought I'd have. The best is yet to come. I, I'm living my Christian life, but I don't see all the blessings of God I want to see. The best is yet to come. I've taught this class for 13 years, and I, I don't know if it's really making a difference. The best is yet to come. It really is. And maybe today, you just need that encouragement from God to hear him say, well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. It's coming. You're not going to see everything yet. But one day, I'm going to reveal the whole thing to you. And you'll see why Adam and Eve had to do what they did. And why Abraham and Sarah and Noah and Moses and Jacob and Joseph and Mary and Joseph and Peter and Paul and John You'll see why they had all they had to do and how all the pieces now come together of the puzzle. And here's the finished thing. As we stand in glory and we see Jesus ascend the throne and as we bring acclamation to the King of kings and the Lord of lords and we say we've made it, we're in heaven, we have eternal life with him, we'll say, it's all good. And it's all right. Because the best has come. Let's pray together. We trust you've enjoyed this message preached at the Bible Baptist Church of St. Thomas, Ontario, pastored by Dr. Al Stone. We invite you to be a part of our worship service this Sunday.